Well, it's good to be here again tonight, and we trust that God will bless and encourage each one of us. We're uh, glad to have Sammy Davis from, all the way from Amherstford. Uh, some of us were here this morning, and your colleague uh, John was with us. It was good to have John with us. So we trust God will uh, bless you with us and encourage us as we hear the Word of God preached. So let's uh, turn to God in prayer. Our Father, we come before you because we realize that you were such a great and glorious God. We realize that we are as dust before you. We realize that we have nothing that we could ever bring to you to achieve salvation. But Lord, we thank you for that grace that has been shown to us, that love and affection that you have drawn us unto yourself. You have embraced us in the covenant of grace. And Lord, that you have told us that you have loved us with an everlasting love and with loving kindness. You've drawn us unto yourself. We Thank you for the truth and the reality of those words. We thank you for the strength that you give us by the indwelling power of your Spirit. We pray, therefore, that your blessing might be upon us now. And so encourage us and be with Sammy as he brings to us your word this night. And uh, we commit all things into your hands. Hear us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing together before the throne of God above. Well, let me just give you some announcements before uh, Sammy comes up and takes over. Uh, on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, our Bible study and prayer meeting, and Dave Evans from Ebenezer Church in Swansea is with us. And then next Sunday at 10.30 and 6 o'clock is communion in the morning, and Mark Cole is with us for both services. And Explorers and Impact will be starting back in May. So there we are then. I can hand it over to you, Sammy. Shall we pray together? Oh Lord God, our loving Heavenly Father, your name is to be cherished above all names. We thank you for this day, for the time that we've been able to spend 
together as your people in your presence. Lord God, I thank you for the way as we have gathered here in Cladach or with us in Ammonford and folks in between and folks farther afield that you have been a God whose name has been lifted up in the hearts, in the minds, in the eyes, on the lips and the voices and the praise of so many of your people. Lord, we thank you that your name is worth glorifying. Your name is worth praising and lifting up. And Lord, we thank you as well that today has been a day when we've been able to seek you and your will, seek you and your wisdom, seek you and your guidance and direction in our lives. Because we know that when we see you as we truly should, our lives are changed, our lives are affected. You are a God that makes a difference for each and every one of us, a God that makes a difference for us as your people in the place that you have placed us, and a God who makes a difference in this world. We thank you that today has been a day, Lord, where we have been able to listen, Lord, and your spirit has been at work shaping us and changing us, transforming us. Long may that continue. And Lord, we come this evening, Lord, with petitions. There are things that weigh on our hearts, questions that we may have, circumstances and situations that we desire your intervention. Perhaps, Lord, things from this morning that John shared that we wish, that we wish, Lord, were truer in our mind's eye, more valuable in each and every one of our hearts. Lord, we bring those petitions to you now and we ask that you would be a God who even now this evening as we gather again would be working and moving in us and amongst us and through us. And we think not of just the situations and the folks who find themselves together in this place this evening but those from this family, Lord, who are scattered in various places this evening. We think especially of Rachel and her situation in the hospital and the operation that she'll be having this evening Lord God we thank you that we live where we do nearby to skilled and qualified people Lord we pray for your grace in that situation we pray for uh, peace for her and for others involved we pray for a quality of care from the doctors we pray for your guiding hand in that whole situation Lord if each of us will bring another name another circumstance and we put it into your hands entrusting everything in our lives to the one who is truly trustworthy. And lastly, we entrust ourselves to you this evening as we look to your word, as we contemplate and consider a story in which Jesus met his followers and helped them to see more fully. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to see more fully, that you would help us to glimpse your true glory, the true greatness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be with us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to sing again. Uh, when I survey the wondrous cross, hymn number 263 in our books, or up on the screen. When I survey the wondrous cross.
We'll be looking this evening at Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35, a passage which is often referred to as the stranger on the road to Emmaus, or if you're from Ammonford, Emmaus. So let's not argue over pronunciation this evening. Uh, That's page 1051 in the Pew Bibles, Luke 24, verses 13 down to 35, as you can see on the screen. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, Well, what things? So they answered him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, Now the chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen even a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And then he said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going uh, further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they arose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared as, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Well, that's the Lord's word. We pray that he blesses it to us this evening. I think our passage this evening presents us with a a question which is often asked by children various ages, but I can say, therefore, your ages. Uh, A question, the answer, answer to which is very similar to that being posed. The question is, why? Do you ever ask the question, why, kids, grown ups? Um, You're told to do something, and you ask, why? And then your parents will give an answer they think is satisfactory, and you come back with another question, why? And then they go a little bit further and a little bit deeper, and then you say, why, and why, and why, and why? And can I let you in on a secret, kids? When you do that, it's really annoying. (laughs) It is really annoying. (laughs) I've got a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old, and the why questions, oh, there's no end to them. But, by the same token, knowing why is really important, isn't it? It's nice when children, or adults even, (laughs) just listen and do what they're told. But we need, more often than not in life, to really understand why certain things are important, why certain things need to be done, why certain things are the way they are, so that we can do them in the right way. Can I give you an example from our household? Each and every day, I have to have this struggle, this argument, this fight with my children about brushing their teeth in the morning. Do any of you refuse to brush your teeth? Do any of you 
think to yourselves, I don't need to brush my teeth today, I did it yesterday. Why or why or why do we have to brush our teeth for two minutes every single morning before we go to school, Daddy? And I give answers, but they never really listen. But ultimately, it would be important, it would be good if my kids understood why it was so important. It would mean that I wouldn't have to tell them and argue with them every day. It would mean that whether I was there with a stopwatch, literally timing them, watching over them, they might do it. Because, did you know this, if you don't brush your teeth, you get cavities which hurt, you get gum ache, you get tooth ache, it's horrible. You also get smelly breath and you scare people away. So it's really important to brush your teeth and to know why, but just to kind of crack on and do it. And today's passage, I think, gives us just this massive, huge why. Why is that? Why does that happen? And the answer, weirdly, is also a why. The question, the big why, is why does Jesus hide himself from his two friends? Why does Jesus hide himself from his two followers? Chapter 13, that very day, it's Easter Sunday. Jesus has died, he's been buried, he's risen again. At the start of Luke chapter 4, we've read about the women who have gone to the tomb. The first opportunity to prepare Jesus' body properly with spices to to pay their last respects as it were they found the stone rolled away they found the tomb empty they've been told by these two dazzling men who they understand to be angels that Jesus isn't there because he's alive that same very day that all that is happening these two followers these two friends of Jesus they're on their way out of Jerusalem they're heading to a place called Emmaus and as they go They're chatting, they're chatting about the things that had happened. They're chatting about, probably, how Jesus had ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey to fanfare. They're chatting about how he'd um, come head to head with the the teachers, the scribes, the elders, how they discussed and debated in the temple. They chatted about that final um, Passover meal that they'd shared and, and how Jesus had directed them. They chatted about perhaps how they'd gone to the Garden of Gethsemane and how Jesus had been betrayed. They chatted about how Jesus had been taken from one court to the next, that no charge would stick to him and yet he was found guilty or at least sentenced as a guilty man and sent to his death. They chatted about how he had died. They chatted about how they'd had to stay at home for the whole Sabbath day. They chatted about the nonsense report that the women had brought them and what on earth to make of it. They chatted about these things. And it says that as they spoke about these things, Jesus himself drew near and went to them. Verse 16, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. You know, one of the things that we as Christians, that I as a minister, that I hope uh, as a church, you would be desperate to share with people is the good news that Jesus is alive. That the body was missing, that the tomb was empty, not because someone had stolen it, or because Jesus had faked his own death or anything like that, but because he had really died and he was really risen to life. So you get to a passage like this, a story like this, when these sad, sad friends, these sad disciples and followers of Jesus are heading away from Jerusalem, perhaps fleeing out of fear, and you've got to ask the question, why on earth would Jesus hide himself? Surely the thing that they need to know more than anything is that what the women are speaking about, what Simon has gone and also confirmed, is is the good news that Jesus has risen from the dead, that he's alive. And there's no easier way for Jesus to share that information with them than to simply come alongside and say, hello, it's me, your old pal. The one that you've spent however many years traveling with. Don't believe me? Here's the holes in my hands. Here's the hole in my side. He who was dead is now alive again, and I am that one. So why on earth does Jesus hide himself from these followers? Well, it's because they needed to know for themselves a bigger why. They needed to see and understand why it was that Jesus had died and risen from the dead. He asks them what they've been talking about, rather cheekily. He knows exactly what's been going on, and he's probably overheard them. Um, But this is what they 
pass back. This is what they tell him. These are the things that, that, that are on our minds, on our hearts about this Jesus of Nazareth. And if you go through with them and you rehearse the things that they say, they get everything right, don't they? That he was a prophet, mighty in both deed and word before God and the people. They get the facts right that he was um, opposed by the rulers, condemned by them to death and crucified. They share this hope, which we might scoff at, but it's a really good biblical hope, isn't it? The hope that he would redeem Israel, that he would put Israel back up on her pedestal, that God's special people would be set free, that God's special people would be released to do what they're called to do by God. They believe and they speak about the fact that it's been three days and now there's this report that the tomb is empty. All the sort of the facts that they share are good. The facts that they share are right and proper. But Jesus understands that they need to understand why all these things have been going on. Why he died and why he rose to life again. See, they've got this grand scheme of things. They've got this grand vision of who the, the Messiah was, who Jesus as the Messiah was, and what that meant that he was going to do. But Jesus listens to their grand scheme, and he tells them that it isn't nearly grand enough. Jesus listens to their grand vision of all things and says, you've only seen a fraction of it. And he says, it sounds a little bit harsh to us, I think, but trust me when I say it's, it's a, out of a place of love and a desire to lead them into all truth that Jesus says to them, how foolish you are, or foolish ones, how slow of heart you are to believe all that the prophets have spoken about me. Jesus wants them to truly see. And so in order to help them to truly see, he hides himself. He hides himself because he's not satisfied with them simply recognizing the truth that he's risen from the dead. He wants them to have this fuller and grander scheme of things, this fuller and grander vision of who he is and what he's accomplished. He wants to help lead them into the whole truth. And he does that by opening up the scriptures beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interprets to them all the scriptures uh, and in those scriptures the things concerning himself. It's a shorthand way of, of sort of what we would call the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, the writings, all of which find their fulfillment, find their uh, center in Jesus. And he helps them to see in so many places and so many ways that their hopes, though good, were just a fraction of the truth. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And we read that and we think, well, yes, come on, that's what they've missed, isn't it? They had these expectations of one who was going to come, um, a new David who was going to defeat the Goliath of Rome and restore the fortunes of the people in the place with God's presence, but they'd missed the fact that there was a suffering servant mentioned in Isaiah, hadn't they? They'd missed the fact that that was to be done through dying and rising to life again. Yes, that's what they needed to know. They needed to have that sense filled out that this is more than just about an ethnicity, a, a people group being restored to power in a certain land. It's about reconciling man and God sinners and a holy God. There had to be death at the center of it. Surely what Jesus did was take them to places like the Passover lamb and the, 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 the goats on the day of atonement and other things like that. The whole sacrificial system and show them this is the picture of the Messiah too. The one who has come to put things all right. Of course he shared those things with them. Of course, I think he would have gone through and highlighted the things that they'd already seen and noticed that meant that they had this hope that the Messiah would restore the nation of Israel. But you know, I fancy that Jesus showed them an awful lot more than that too. Jesus showed them all about himself, all that he was and is and was doing and will do. 
that the Christ, the Messiah, would have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory. I have a fear for us as a church in Ammonford. I'm going to project that fear onto you that just like these friends on the road to Emmaus, we've got a grand scheme of who Christ is, what Christ is doing, and it is not nearly grand enough. We have seen the truth that Jesus has risen from the dead. He's been revealed to our eyes, but we've lost the fuller picture of who he is. I love the description of what happens to these friends of his as he takes them through the scriptures as they see Jesus and what he's all about they say at the end didn't our hearts burn within us as we were there on the road listening to him we see things about Jesus we hear good news claims about Jesus that he has come for the forgiveness of sins that he's come so that we need no longer be strangers and aliens and enemies of God but be friends adopted in that he has come to begin the good work of putting all things right we hear good news and we respond with worship I fear for us in Amford like I say and projecting on you guys as well that we're satisfied too easily with the sliver of Jesus that we have. Jesus wants us, as he wanted them, to enter into all truth. I've been preparing this last week or two in the book of Ephesians. As a church, we have home groups, and for the next term or so, we're going to be looking at Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus and the churches around that place and it starts off with this really famous prayer of praise and as you work your way through it it's a little bit complicated it's a it's a long single sentence prayer of praise about the wonderful things that God has done praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in every in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing and then it pours out and it pours out it's this wonderful thing of praise and there are portions of it that we pick out and we think yes amen that's true yes amen that's true it speaks about adoption it speaks about grace it speaks about redemption and blood and forgiveness but it has this point this center which speaks about the purpose of everything that Jesus was doing the purpose of the redemption of Jews and Gentiles alike why it is that Christ was coming and graciously living and dying and rising why forgiveness was on offer and it says this to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth under Christ he's got a similar statement and a similar sort of opening to the letter to the Galatians Through Jesus Christ, Paul says, God the Father was reconciling to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, none of us would sit here, none of us would stand here and say we don't believe in that. But if we were to try and articulate what our hope is, as those friends did on the way to Emmaus, I wonder whether it would capture the fullness of what Paul saw a forgiven people who were part of something more a christ who wasn't just a savior of individuals but was at work reconciling all things in heaven and on earth through his blood we satisfy ourselves with too small even if we consider it grand a picture of jesus and what he's about but jesus desires us to know why that is why jesus hid himself and when they heard when they saw when they grasped a greater scheme a greater vision of who jesus was let's not try and force onto it any sort of articulation of of what it is that they grasped in that moment but the doors were blown off their hearts burned within them and they were changed by that They were changed by that. Verse 28, as they drew near to the village, Jesus made as if he was traveling on, but they urged him strongly to come in, to stay with them. They wanted to show hospitality to Jesus in this moment. One of the things that I like to do is to to sit and to contemplate, to muse 
on the emotions of various people in certain circumstances in, in the stories in the Gospels. We were doing it the other week with the women who quickly made their way to the tomb um, in order to, pre to prepare Jesus' body for burial, just to think, well, here are these women who couldn't do what they wanted to do to pay their respect, to show their love to Jesus on the Friday. They'd had to wait all day Saturday, and they were willing to go at the break of dawn at first light to do what was necessary on the Sunday. What was the thing in their hearts that they wanted to do was to practically love Jesus in whatever way they could. In my imagination, if nowhere else, these followers of Jesus, it's again the same Sunday. What is the first thing that they're going to do? I feel like they're fleeing. I feel like they're running. I feel like it's, it's really hot to be a follower of Jesus in Jerusalem. Peter has been denying knowing Jesus. These guys are hot tailing it out. And yet something has happened in them, something has changed them, that they want to show hospitality to this stranger. Maybe it's because they liked the things that he was saying, but I think they're truly being changed as they saw the truth, as they understood the scope of what Jesus was about. They were affected by it. Hospitality is the hallmark of someone who has come to have that fuller faith in Jesus. In the letter to the Hebrews, it says this, keep on loving one another, as brothers and sisters, do not forget to show hospitality even to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Hear this pair, having grasped something new about the grandeur of Jesus and what he is doing, a move to show love and kindness to this stranger, even in a dangerous situation. They show hospitality and they don't entertain just angels, messengers of the Most High God. They entertain the risen Lord. That's marvellous, isn't it? That when they see, even without seeing Jesus, they're changed, they're transformed by him. Over dinner, their eyes are opened. We could have debates over how it was that Jesus hid himself. Was it miraculous? Was it mechanical? Did he sort of supernaturally make it so that they didn't recognize him? Or did he just have a hood and a scarf? I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters because I think the reverse works just as well. That he either miraculously opened their eyes or he comes in and he sits down and he breaks bread and he takes his scarf and his hood off and they see as he hands them the bread, the scars, however it is. They see him, they recognize him and that hope which had been dashed at the start of the story, had been enlarged through what they learnt, and is now being secured, fulfilled, re relit, if you like, in their lives. I just note one more thing before moving on to a few thoughts of application. That when Jesus then left them and they moved to go and tell the other disciples about it, verse 35, what is it that they tell the disciples? Again, we'd quite well imagine that the first thing that they'd want to say, or the first thing that they'd want to share is, it's not nonsense what the women told us. The tomb is definitely empty because we've just seen the risen Lord Jesus. And they, they do say that because obviously it's quite a remarkable thing that they've done when they recognize who he is. But verse 35, they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. They told what had happened on the road. How this stranger had opened up the scriptures and, and told them, basically, you've seen something of who this Jesus was and what he was about, but there is so much more to it. They're desperate to tell their friends, their fellow disciples, this fuller, grander vision that they have of Jesus. So just a few sort of closing thoughts about like how we respond to that, other than being gladdened by the fact that Jesus wants us to know the full picture. I mean, that should be enough for us this evening, shouldn't it? Just to think that Jesus isn't satisfied with us seeing in part, that God has always been a God who reveals in ever increasing degrees to his people who he is and what he's about. He desires that we not remain in ignorance, but move into a fuller knowledge and understanding, appreciation and relationship with him. More than that, which is 
plenty enough? What are some of the things that we can just think about in terms of us responding? Well, the first, slightly random, but I love the fact that these two followers, at least in my imagination, running away from Jerusalem because they're scared, certainly not knowing everything that's going on, still had Jesus on their lips. They still were speaking to one another about him. And I was thinking how, how comfortable we are as Christians in certain strategic places, in certain set times to speak and to think about Jesus. But does he fill our minds and our hearts and, and, and is he on our lips just as we're wandering from place to place? I think we do well to make their habit our habit of just speaking about Jesus to one another. Whether we know all of the facts or not, whether we think we're people who have the information to inform and transform the person that we're speaking or not, or whether we're just people who have questions, people who have thoughts, people who are trying to grapple with this weighty one who is in front of us. They had this habit of speaking about him informally as they went. I think that would be a wonderful habit for us to rediscover as a church. That's the first thing that perhaps we can do to respond. Not just in our set times, in our strategic times, in our safe times, but perhaps when we're full of fear, when we recognize our own ignorance, still to be a people who speak to each other about Jesus. Secondly, I'd say, and this isn't from their example, this is just from seeing how Jesus treats them, why he hides himself, because he wants to lead them into the why, Not to be a people who speak about Jesus and a people who seek Jesus more and more, who aren't willing to settle for that sliver of Jesus that we already have, that we say that we believe in the good news but desire to hear and understand the great news, who understand Jesus to be a wonderful saviour but seek to... to, to move into a fuller comprehension of, of how he's an indescribable saviour. I'm not speaking about switching the pool that we're swimming in, but moving further from the edge and diving deeper in. We're moved to praise, we're moved to worship, we're moved to obedience when we see who Jesus is. And I believe that we should have this sort of restless state always as his followers that we want to know him more. Don't leave it to chance. Make deepening your relationship and your knowledge with Jesus a priority. First, speak about him. Second, seek him. Thirdly, let him shine a light on the scriptures for you. There's always been an odd relationship, I think, between the Old and the New Testament and in how we view them together, their usefulness. Very often we kind of think that perhaps the New Testament is where we will go to meet Jesus, to understand Jesus, to the gospel. You want to introduce someone to Jesus, explain to them who Jesus is, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, wherever it is. Take them to the stories of his ministry, um, for three years, his death, his resurrection, that's how they'll see, that's how they'll encounter, that's how they'll understand. And yet, what do we find when we come to the Gospels? Well, they are heavily drenched in Moses and the prophets and the writings. Truth is, you can't really understand what on earth Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John are going on about unless you fully understand the scriptures that they're constantly referring to. Um, as, a, as an example, Mark begins, doesn't he? The beginning of the good news of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, and immediately quotes from various prophets. The, the New Testament, I would say, is a dark, dark place unless we understand the Old Testament. And here Jesus is showing that the Old Testament is a dark, dark place unless we've understood the New Testament. <laughs> So seek that Christ would be shining a light through both testaments. Speak about him, seek him, 
have that Christ-centered light shining on both Testaments, the whole Scriptures. J.C. Ryle put it like this, once we lose sight of Christ in our Scriptures, we will find the whole Bible dark and full of difficulty. And I think that, I think that means... I think that means when we've only got such a small view of Christ and we're searching for that view of Christ to be buttressed up or reaffirmed constantly in all places, there will be passages, there will be stories, there will be arcs and themes that make no sense to us because they don't align with the Jesus we are expecting to meet. And to have this desire for a fuller sense and to search for Jesus wherever we are. And the last thing, the last encouragement I would give us is this. As we seek to go deeper with Jesus, speaking about him, searching for him, shining a light in the old and the new, it would be to invite Christ to help us to see, to call on the helper that he has promised, who is instructed to lead us into all truth. I'm pretty confident in my own intellectual capabilities. I fancy myself as quite an intelligent human being. And I can quite easily fall into the trap of thinking that as long as I've got a Bible and a biro, I can figure it out. I just don't think that's true. Even if it is true to a degree, it needn't be true. Because it was Jesus who drew alongside these boys and help them to see more fully how great and how grand he is. Jesus, who has promised to send the Spirit to be at work in us, to help lead us into all truth. I think we should be inviting Christ by his Spirit to help us to see more of him. Sometimes we lack confidence when we pray, because we don't know whether God desires the same things we do, can I give you a prayer that God is absolutely going to answer because it is 100% his will. Father, help me to see your son. Help me to know him. Help me to love him. Help me to live for him. When we invite Christ by the Spirit to help illuminate the scriptures to us, that is a prayer that he answers. So let's speak about Jesus with one another. Let's um, strive for more of Jesus and a greater understanding of who he is and what he has done in all of the scriptures as as he shines a light on them and invite the Spirit to help us to come and to understand because Jesus wants us to know who he is and why he came and did what he did. Shall I pray before we sing our final hymn? Lord God, we thank you this evening that you are a God whose desire is for us to know. That you are a God of light and who loves to shine light into dark places. To fill that darkness with the light of the knowledge of you through Jesus Christ. Lord, we we thank you how you are a God who has opened eyes, helped us to see here is Jesus, truly the Son of God, the Son of Man, the one who came, who lived, who died, who rose, who ascended. Lord, we thank you so much for the knowledge of salvation that we have, and we pray that you would continue to shine that light, continue to lead us into truth by your Spirit through the Scriptures. Help us to have an even greater, grander vision scheme of all things. Because we want to be a people whose hearts burn as we see Jesus and as we learn more truly and deeply how truly wonderful he is. We want to be a people whose lives are even more affected by who Jesus is and who, what Jesus has done. We thank you this evening that you're a God who desires for us to know, who will lead us into truth. So we pray that you would send your spirit, you would fill us up, you would help us to comprehend just how wide, just how high, just how deep. Jesus, the good news, your grace and your love are. Oh, we've got lifetimes. Lifetimes to pursue you. And I pray that you would help us to be restless in that pursuit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's sing one last song to finish. Let's sing, Thine 
be the glory. It's hymn number 281, if you're using a book. And it's speaking about seeing and beholding and understanding and cherishing this risen one who is ours, the King Jesus. Sing together. us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us. The Lord give us his peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>